Good evening aspirants, welcome to the Hindu daily news analysis brought to you by Shankara Ace Academy for the date 31st of January 2023. These are the articles which we will be discussing today. Now let's start with the first article for the day. Take a look at this FAQ article displayed here. This news article is taken from the Hindu newspaper dated 29th of January 2023. See, on January 27th, the stock markets in India have concluded its transition to the T plus 1 settlement cycle. India has now become the second largest market after China to have made such a transition. Here know that India is also ahead of US, Europe and Japan in this particular regard. US and Japan are only othering to T plus 2 settlement cycles, while India has moved on to T plus 1 settlement cycle. Here note that the paced transition to T plus 1 settlement cycle in India had begun on February 25th, 2022. Now, what are these T plus 1 and T plus 2 settlement cycles? This is what we are going to understand through this discussion. For your better understanding about the settlement cycles in the stock market, we have to first learn about the basics on which trading is carried out in stock market. First of all, what is a stock market? See, a stock market is a marketplace where buyers and sellers virtually meet to trade, that is to buy and sell shares or securities of publicly listed companies. Here note that stock market is otherwise known as share market or a equity market. See, it is nothing but a marketplace which is exclusively in an online mode. Here the buyers and sellers meet to transact and trade securities in an online medium. Now we will understand the functioning of the stock market with an example. Let's assume that a person Ramu wants to sell his 10 shares of Reliance Industries at rupees 1000 per share. So he will place a sell order on the stock exchange. The stock exchange will then find a buyer who wants to buy 10 shares of Reliance Industries at rupees 1000 per share. Therefore, we can see that stock market acts as a virtual market where buyers and sellers meet to trade shares. This is all about the basics of the working of the stock market. Here note that a trade in the stock market involves three important processes. They are execution of trade, clearing of trade and settlement of trade. These three processes are done one after another. Now we will understand them one by one. First, let's take execution of trade. See, the term execution of trade refers to the process of completion of a purchase or sale order for security. When an execution of trade is said to be taken place, the seller and buyer have agreed to trade at the given price. This is about the first process. Now moving on to the second function in trading that is clearing of trade. Clearing refers to the correct and timely transfer of funds to the seller of the securities and transfer of securities to the buyer. For this purpose, a specialized organization often acts as an intermediary. This intermediary is only known as clearing house. It assumes the role of buyer and seller to reconcile orders between the transacting parties. Now coming to the final process. This process is known as settlement of trade. Trade settlement is a two-way process which comes in the final stage of the transaction. Once the buyer receives the securities and the seller gets the payment for the same, the trade is said to be settled. Know that the date on which the settlement takes place is called the settlement date. This is all about the basics of the functioning of stock markets. Now moving on to the settlement cycles. Just now we saw about the settlement of trade, right? See in trading there is a fixed time period for the settlement of trades. This time period is only termed as settlement cycle. Now coming to the answer for the question which I asked at the start of this discussion. What is meant by T plus 1 and T plus 2 settlement cycles? Firstly know that letter T refers to the trading day. So T plus 1 settlement cycle means that trade related settlements must be done within a day or 24 hours of the completion of the trading. For example if a customer brought securities under T plus 1 on Monday the securities would be credited to the customer on the next day that is Tuesday. See, T plus 1 is different from T plus 2. In T plus 2, it would take another one day to settle the trade. That is, if a customer brought securities on Monday, then the trade will be settled only on the Wednesday. 
Therefore, we can say that under the T plus 1 settlement cycle, the trade related settlements must be done within a day which is nothing but 24 hours. Now, let's see briefly about the history of settlement cycles in India. See, until 2001, Indian stock markets had a weekly settlement system. After that, they moved to a rolling settlement system of T plus 3. Then, in the year 2003, the Indian stock markets moved to T plus 2 settlement system. After a period of operating in T plus 2 settlement cycle mode, India is now moving to the T plus 1 settlement system. With this understanding, now we will see about what are all the benefits associated with the T plus 1 settlement system. The first benefit is the reduction in time of the settlement. See, in the T plus 1 format, if an investor sells a share, he will get the money within a day and the buyer also will get the share within a day. So, time reduction is the first benefit. The second benefit is that T plus 1 system will provide liquidity to the investors very soon as compared to the earlier T plus 2 system. That is, their funds for the sold shares would be credited to their account a day earlier. So, the investors will have the benefit of deploying their cash for a day more in buying other shares. These are the two benefits which are associated with the T plus 1 settlement system over the T plus 2 settlement system. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen about the term T plus 1 settlement system. We also briefly saw about how stock markets operate. And finally, we also saw about the benefits associated with moving towards T plus 1 settlement system. With these points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Take a look at this article given here. It says that Supreme Court will examine whether the petitions regarding the electoral bond scheme need to be referred to a constitution bench or not. See, there are numerous petitions filed in the Supreme Court regarding this particular scheme. The petitions contend that electoral bond scheme has opened the doors for anonymous donations to political parties before the elections. This is about the news article given here. In this context, let us see some facts regarding the electoral bond scheme in prelims perspective. First of all, what are electoral bonds? In simple words, electoral bonds can be defined as instruments through which anyone can donate money to political parties. It was introduced in the year 2018 with an aim to bring transparency in the electoral funding process. See, this bond is a bearer instrument in the nature of a promissory note which are donated to the political party in an anonymous manner. Now, coming to the question, who can buy electoral bonds? The answer to the question is that any citizen of India or a body incorporated in India will be eligible to purchase the bonds. The significance of this bond is that the bond will not contain the name of the donor. Thus, it maintains anonymity in the funding process. Now, let's see a few additional facts regarding this particular scheme. See, electoral bonds are issued in the denominations of rupees 1000, rupees 10,000, rupees 1 lakh, rupees 10 lakh and rupees 1 crore. These bonds can be brought from authorized branches of the State Bank of India. Here, the donor is required to pay the amount via a check or a digital mechanism to the authorized SBI bank. Here note one important point, cash cannot be used to buy electoral bonds in India. Also note that the bonds only have a lifetime of 15 days during which it should be used for making donation to the political parties. Here also note that donations can be done only to the political parties registered under Section 29A of the Representation of the People's Act 1951. The party which is going to receive the donation should have secured at least one percentage of the votes polled in the last general election to the House of People or the Legislative Assembly. This is the eligibility criteria for the political parties to receive donations through electoral bonds. Moving on, let us now see about the availability of the bonds. The bonds under the scheme will be available for a purchase period of 10 days each in the months of January, April, July and October. An additional period of 30 days will be specified by the central government in the year of general election to the Lok Sabha. This is all about electoral bond scheme. Through this discussion, we have seen some factual information about the electoral bond scheme. Make a note of all the points which I have discussed. With this, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Now, take a look at this news article given here. It reports about the recent objections raised by the Attorney General of India or Venkataramani. 
See, these objections were raised relating to the petitions which are being filed in the Supreme Court against various state religious conversion laws. The particular case which the article reports about concerns anti-conversion laws of nine states including Uttar Pradesh, Himachal Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Gujarat, Chhattisgarh, Haryana, Jharkhand and Karnataka. This is the crux of the article given here. In this discussion today, let's concentrate on the basics. We will see about Attorney General of India in detail. When it comes to Attorney General of India, you must know about Article 76. Article 76 of the Indian Constitution gives information about the appointment, qualification, term of office and functions of the Attorney General of India. Firstly, note that Attorney General of India is appointed by the President of India. Secondly, the person to be appointed as the Attorney General of India should be qualified to be appointed as a Judge of the Supreme Court. See, there are certain conditions which needs to be satisfied by a person to be eligible to be qualified to be appointed as a judge of the Supreme Court. These criteria should be satisfied by the person who wishes to be appointed as the Attorney General of India. Thirdly, as per Article 76, the Attorney General of India holds office during the pleasure of the President. So, Attorney General of India doesn't have any security of his or her tenure. Fourthly, Article 76 says that the remuneration of the Attorney General of India is determined by the President. Now, let's see the functions of Attorney General of India. Attorney General of India gives advice to the Government of India regarding legal matters involving it. He also performs other duties of legal character referred or assigned to him by the President. Thirdly, he discharges the functions conferred on him by or under the constitution or any other law for the time being in force. Here note that while discharging these duties, Attorney General of India has the right of audience in all courts. This is all about the Attorney General of India. In the constitution, another article is concerned about the Attorney General of India. We will now see about this article as well. Article 88 of the Indian Constitution talks about the right of the Ministers and Attorney General of India in the Parliament. As per this article, Attorney General of India has the right to speak and take part in the proceedings of either House and any joint sitting of the Houses. He also has the right to speak and take part in the proceedings of any committee of the Parliament. Here note that he can only take part in the functioning of those committees in which he is named as a member. Also note that he cannot take part in the voting process in the parliament. Now that is all for the provisions of the Attorney General in the constitution. Now let's see a few prelims pointers about Attorney General. Here note that Attorney General is the highest law officer in the country. The term of the Attorney General is not fixed by the constitution. Constitution does not contain the procedure and grounds for his removal. Other than this, he can resign by writing to the president. Conventionally, he resigns when the government which appointed him resigns or is replaced. Other than these points, also note that he is not debarred from private legal practice. Finally, he is also eligible for reappointment. I have given here some of the limitations of the Attorney General of India. Just go through it. This is all about Attorney General of India. Through this discussion, we came to know about Attorney General of India the articles present in the constitution relating to Attorney General of India and also about some of the functions which are performed by him. With these points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. See, yesterday the Delhi police told the Supreme Court that it has substantially completed its investigation into the hate speech incidents in the national capital. Previously, Supreme Court of India has asked the Delhi police to expedite the process of investigation into the crimes which involves hate speech. So from this article given today, we can see that Delhi police has paid heed to the directions given out by the Supreme Court. See this particular article is not per se relevant for our examination, but we will take this opportunity to revise about hate speech. So in this news article discussion, let us understand what is hate speech and the legal provisions relating to hate speech in India. Let's start with the definition of hate speech. See, there is no specific legal definition of hate speech. But in the 267th report of the Law Commission of India, hate speech is defined as an incitement to hatred primarily against a group of persons. The group of persons can be anyone in terms of race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, religious belief, etc. In simpler words, hate speech is any word written or spoken 
which also includes signs visible representation within the hearing or sight of a person with the intention to cause fear or alarm or incitement to violence so all these actions like speeches writings signs and representations that create violence and spread disharmony between the communities and groups is criminalized in india here you must understand one thing the right to free speech ends where hate speech begins under the pretext of exercising inherent rights many commit the crime of hate speech and create an atmosphere of distrust and terror in that line only the 267th report of law commission of india beautifully mentions that liberty and equality are contemporary and not antithetical to each other that is the intention of having the freedom of speech under article 19 class 1 sub class a of the constitution is not to disregard the weaker sections of society but to give them an equal voice so if in the name of free speech when an hate speech is delivered which marginalizes certain people then the liberty of those people is snatched away here i have provided the legal provisions related to hate speech in india you can pause the video and go through it with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we came to know about hate speech and how it is antithetical to the article 19 class 1 sub class a of the indian constitution with these points in mind now let's move on to the next article discussion now for our next discussion let's take up this editorial article as you all know food and agricultural organization of the united nations has declared 2023 as the international year of millets this is the context based on which the article is written so in this news article discussion let us understand some of the important points mentioned in this article before that the syllabus relevant for this article is highlighted here interested aspirants can go through it now let's start with the question what is a millet see millets are a group of small grained cereal food crops they have special nutritive properties like high protein high dietary fiber they also contain micronutrients and antioxidants here note that millets are known for their special agronomic characteristics that is they are drought resistant and suitable for cultivation in regions which are arid and semi arid in nature so the benefit of millets are twofold one is it is good for our health and the other is it can be cultivated even in a semi arid region now coming to the types of millets which are grown in india see there are two different types of millets grown first group is called major millets which include sorghum pearl millet and finger millet the other one is called minor millet which includes foxtail little kodo proso and brownyard millets these are the two types of millets which are grown now in india despite all these benefits which i have mentioned millet cultivation and consumption have not actually increased for example in the year 2019 to 2020 the total production of nutri cereals was 47.7 million tons in india in that the production of sorghum pearl millet and finger millet along with other millets put together was only 18.9 million tons now compare this with maize maize is a non millet crop used mainly as a feed its production in the same year was 28.8 million tons that is if we exclude millets the remaining portion of nutri grain production is entirely comprised of one non millet crop which is nothing but maize so from this we can infer that production of millet in india is very low this is the first major problem associated with millet cultivation in india the production is very low now coming to the other problem see the procurement and consumption by the states is also very low see with the said production inclusion of millets in the pds shops would be possible only if more than 50 percentage production of the millets are procured directly by the government see this is not possible government cannot procure more than 50 percentage of the millet production in india because of this reason only millets make up very small quantity of the central storage pool of grains so here comes the question what are the obstacles to increase millet production and consumption firstly the decline in the area under millet cultivation is a problem over the last decade the production of sorghum has fallen the production of pearl millet has also stagnated and the production of other millets including finger millet has also stagnated or even declined there is also rapid decline in the minor millet cultivation also 
See, this is mainly due to the shift in land use towards more profitable crops like pineapple, coffee and pepper. This is the first problem. Now coming to the second problem. The second problem is the low productivity of millets. See, when a particular land is used for the cultivation of millets, only a small quantity of saleable millet is produced in the land. When the particular land is used for cultivation of other crops, the productivity of crops is so huge so that farmers tend to produce the other crops than millets. Over the last decade, millet yield has not increased leading to the low productivity. Besides this, millet processing is a time consuming and laborious task performed only by human. See, even in the 21st century, hand pounding is done by human to remove the outer layers of the millets. The productivity decreases because of this also. Apart from this, the marketing strategy of millets produced by the farmers is also poor. Here also note that only a small portion of millets were only processed into value added products. This is the second issue. So, the author of this article says that unless productivity and production are increased, all efforts to consume millets will be useless. Remember, availability is the important factor in changing food habits of the population. Here comes the next question. How can we increase the productivity, production and availability of millets? Firstly, crop diversity in local millet varieties should be preserved to increase production and consumption of millets. For this specific purpose, community seed banks can be established. These community seed banks can be designed and constructed to conserve, restore, revive, strengthen and improve local seed systems. Apart from this, yield can be enhanced through participatory varietal traits. Here, participatory varietal traits are nothing but a process in which agronomists learn which varieties perform well on farm and are preferred by the farmers. Such trials can be encouraged for improving seed selection. Along with that, new agronomic practices and new technologies can be combined to enhance the productivity of millets. By this way, we can make the farmers grow millets. Other than this, customized post harvest machinery like pulverizer, dehullers can be introduced. Pulverizer helps in grinding of the grains, whereas dehullers helps in removing hulls from the grains. By introducing these machineries, we can replace the role of women manually pounding millets for us. This in turn will also increase the productivity of millet cultivation. Thirdly, new marketing strategies regarding millets can be introduced. Here know that a kilogram of little millet rice is sold only for rupees 7, while a kilogram of millet upma is sold for nearly rupees 40. One step of processing has yielded 5 times of profit. So, by including food processing into the millet cultivation, we can many times increase the fold of income which are going to the farmers of the millet. In conclusion, we can say that increasing the production of millets and reversing the decline in area cultivated are feasible steps to increase the millet production in our country. But these steps require multiple interventions including scientific inputs, institutional mechanisms, financial incentives and in-kind support. Most importantly, small farmers in hilly regions and railland plains who are among the poorest households in rural India are going to cultivate millets only if it gives them good returns. So, to make millet cultivation profitable, adequate public support is required. And that is exactly why we should pay attention to the economics of millet cultivation. Just by ensuring supply for the PDS, we can ensure availability and provide nutritional benefits to a wide section of the population. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we came to know about the term millets, the two types of millets, the problems plaguing the production of millets in India. And finally, we also saw some solution as suggested by the author to increase the cultivation of millets in India and also improve their productivity. With these learned points in mind, now let's move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this news article. It says that the central government would soon set up the 16th Finance Commission. The process for it has been initiated and the terms of reference would soon be notified as per the news article given here. Now, we will take this opportunity to revise some basic points about the Finance Commission. We will start by understanding the constitutional provisions regarding Finance Commission. Then, we will see the composition, qualifications of members and the appointment process and finally, we will also see its functioning as well. This is the syllabus relevant to this discussion. Just go through it. See, Finance Commission is constituted once every five years by the President. 
This has been done according to the provisions of the Article 280 of the Indian Constitution. This means that it's a constitutional body. The main purpose of the body is to give recommendations to the government of India on the distribution of its tax revenues. We will see about the functions of the Finance Commission a little later. Now talking about its composition. See the Finance Commission as a chairman and four other members appointed by the President. The government of India provides necessary support and manpower including a secretary to the commission to facilitate its work. Now coming to the qualifications of the members. As per the provisions of the Finance Commission Act 1951 and the Finance Commission rules of the same year, the chairman of the commission is selected from among members who have experience in public affairs. Here note that the four other members are selected from among members who are qualified to be appointed as judge of a high court or have special knowledge of the finances and accounts of government or have wide experience in financial matters and in administration or have special knowledge of economics. For your understanding, see this image. You can see the composition and qualifications of the members of the 15th Finance Commission. As you can see, they are all from different fields of expertise. As I told you earlier, they are elected by the President of India. Here note that they serve for the length of time indicated by the President in his order. Also note that they have a chance to be reappointed again. Now we will see about the functions of the Finance Commission. See, Finance Commission primarily performs three important functions. One is called the Vertical Devolution, the second one is the Horizontal Devolution and the third one is the recommendation regarding the devolution of funds to the local institutions present in the states. Now coming to the first important function. Firstly, the Finance Commission shall make recommendations to the President on the distributions of the net proceeds of taxes which are to be divided between the Union and the states. This is what I mentioned as vertical distribution. Secondly, the Finance Commission shall also make recommendations to the President on the allocation of the net proceeds of the taxes between the states themselves, that is, between the state governments. This is called as horizontal distribution. Thirdly, it shall also consider the mechanism by which central government can devolve funds to the local institutions present in the states. Here the term local institutions refers to the panchayats and municipal bodies. Finally, final function of the Finance Commission is to consider any other subject that the President refers to the panel in the interest of prudent financial management. These are all the functions of the Finance Commission. You may have a question whether the recommendation spelt out by the Finance Commission should be implemented by the government or not. Here note that all the recommendations spelt out by the Finance Commission are only advisory in nature. Government need not implement all of the recommendations put forward by the Finance Commission. To put it in other words, it is nowhere laid down in the constitution that the recommendations of the Commission shall be binding upon the Government of India. This is all with respect to Finance Commission. Through this discussion, we came to know about Finance Commission, the eligibility of its members and finally we saw some of the functions of the Finance Commission. With these learned points, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Now let us take this data point for our next discussion. It says that the trial courts in India have imposed the highest number of death penalty in over 20 years. This is despite the UN Human Rights Recommendation for the Universal Abolition of the Death Penalty. This data point shows the reasons for the rise in death penalty this year and gives some suggestions in this regard. So we will now see what the article says in detail. Have a look at this graph. It shows the number of prisoners on death row in India at the end of each year. If you can see, the figure has reached its peak in the year 2022. The major reason for the rise in death penalty as highlighted by the article is a special ruling in a case related to the 2008 Ahmedabad serial blast. The court here awarded death penalty to as many as 38 convicts. This case therefore spiked the total number of death penalty in the year 2022. Now look at this graph. It shows that Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh and Jharkhand have recorded significant increase in death sentences imposed by trial courts in 2022. The article further says that the number would soon come down owing to the initiatives taken by the Supreme Court in this regard. Previous orders of the Supreme Court had called for a meaningful, real and effective hearing for the accused before awarding the death sentence. 
Another major factor for the rise in death penalty was the low disposal rate of death penalty cases by the appellate courts. See, when the trial court has given a person death penalty, he would obviously move to higher courts for appeal. But the appellate courts are slow in disposing these cases. In the year 2022, from the 67 decided cases by the high courts, 48 prisoners saw their death sentences commuted to life imprisonment. And 43 prisoners were acquitted of all charges and only 3 cases were confirmed. If you can see, the share of cases where the death sentence was confirmed by the appellate courts are very less, both in the case of High Court and Supreme Court. See, this particular data is very much revealing. Only a very small amount of death penalty cases which gets appealed to the Superior Court is getting confirmed. So, majority of the death penalty cases are generally commuted to life imprisonment or in some specific cases ultimately results in acquittal also. So, from this we can say that the majority of the death penalty cases which are decided by the trial courts when moved to the appellate courts are getting changed to less harsher punishments. So, the author recommends that the constitution bench should make it necessary for the trial court to understand the accused better before passing the sentence. It should go beyond the report of jail authorities or parole officers and get the help of psychologists and behavioural experts. A study into the childhood experiences and upbringing of the accused should be considered while the court is awarding a death penalty. This is all about the data point given here. In this short discussion, we saw some revealing facts about death penalty cases in India. With these points in mind, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Now, take a look at this news article. This news article expresses the viewpoints of the current UNGA president. The president of UNGA is saying that the reform of United Nations Security Council is a member-driven process and for that, the members of the UNGA have to first come together to pass a resolution demanding the reform of Security Council. Primarily, this article deals with the reform to the United Nations Security Council. In this context, let us see about the permanent membership of UNSC and also about how a new country can be added to the permanent membership status in the United Nations Security Council. We all know that United Nations Security Council has 5 permanent members and 10 non-permanent members. So, totally 15 members are present in there. The 5 permanent members are often referred as P5. The P5 countries are China, France, Russian Federation, United Kingdom and United States. Among the 10 non-permanent members, 5 of them are elected each year by the General Assembly for a 2-year term. Recently, India has been elected as the non-permanent member for the period 2021 and 2022. Here note that P5 members have veto powers which can be used by them to veto any resolution passed by the United Nations General Assembly. This is all about the basic structure of United Nations Security Council. Now, let's see how the United Nations Security Council can be reformed. To reform any parts of the United Nations Security Council, a resolution need to be first moved in the United Nations General Assembly. See, this particular resolution has to be moved by nearly two-third members of the total members of the United Nations. As you all know, total membership of United Nations is around 193 countries. Two-thirds of it will be 110 countries. So, to reform UNSC, 110 countries need to come together and pass a resolution. And this resolution need to be ratified again by the 110 countries which are passing the resolution. After this, the resolution moves to the United Nations Security Council's permanent 5 members. These 5 members also need to accept the resolution to bring changes in the United Nations Security Council. So, let's say India want to become an United Nations Security Council permanent member. For this, India need to draft a resolution which is to be signed and ratified by 110 countries of the United Nations and this resolution need to be passed by the all 5 countries which are present in the permanent membership of the United Nations Security Council. Then only India can become a permanent member in the United Nations Security Council. Not only for membership, for any of the reform in the United Nations Security Council, this is the mechanism which should be followed. So, this is how exactly United Nations Security Council can be reformed by using a resolution passed in the United Nations General Assembly. Here, the President of United Nations General Assembly is saying that the members of the United Nations are not willing to come together to reform the United Nations Security Council. He also says that there exist a deep differences between the opinions of the General Assembly members itself so that they cannot even pass the necessary resolution which can reform the United Nations Security Council. 
This is what is briefly discussed in the article. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we saw about the necessary condition which need to be satisfied to bring reform in the United Nations Security Council. With this, let's move on to the next part of our Hindu daily news analysis, which is nothing but the prelims practice question discussion. Today, I have taken five different questions for our discussion. Four will be discussed by me and one will be the quiz question for you. Now, coming to the first question. It is a two statement question and we have to find the correct statements. Statement one. Blasphemy is the act of insulting or showing contempt or lack of reverence for God. See, this statement is correct. Blasphemy is an act which involves disregard for gods. So, statement one is right. Now, coming to the second statement. There is no formal legislation against blasphemy in India. See, this statement is also correct. India doesn't have any explicit blasphemy laws in India. But that does not mean we cannot punish blasphemy. The closest equivalent to blasphemy law is section 295A of the Indian Penal Code. This particular section punishes any speech, writings or signs that with premeditated and malicious insult citizens' religion or religious beliefs with a fine and imprisonment for up to three years. So the correct answer for this question is option C, both 1 and 2. Now moving on to the second question. See, this is a previous year question and it is related to Attorney General of India and Solicitor General of India. Two statements are given and we have to find the right statements. Now coming to the first statement. Attorney General of India and Solicitor General of India are the only officers of the government who are allowed to participate in the meetings of the Parliament of India. See, this statement is wrong. According to the Constitution, Attorney General of India only has the right to participate in the meetings of the Parliament of India. Solicitor General of India doesn't have any right to sit in the meetings of the Parliament. So, statement one is incorrect. Now, coming to the second statement. According to the Constitution of India, the Attorney General of India submits his resignation when the government which appointed him resigns. See, this statement is also incorrect. There is nowhere mentioned in the Constitution of India that the Attorney General of India must resign when the government which appointed him resigns. But note that Attorney General of India normally resigns when the government which appoints him resigns because of the convention. According to the constitution, he holds office during the pleasure of the government. So statement 2 is also wrong. It is not according to the constitution but according to the convention which got developed in India. From this we can say that both statement 1 and 2 are wrong. So the correct answer for this question is option D, neither 1 nor 2. Now moving on to the third question. The question is relating to G4 nations and we have to find the correct option which contains all the nations which are part of the G4. Let me reread the question now. Which among the following countries constitute the G4 nations? Germany, Brazil, Australia and India. See, Australia is not a G4 nation. So, we can eliminate 3 in the options. By eliminating, we can see that option C is the correct answer. G4 nations comprises Brazil, India, Germany and Japan. G4 nations have a common goal of making UNSC more representative. They support each other's bid for a permanent membership in the UN Security Council. Here, let me give you another grouping. The grouping is called as L.69 group. Now, comment in the comment section what is the goal of this particular grouping. Now, moving on to the fourth question. This question is related to electoral bonds. Two statements are given and we have to choose the correct statement. Now coming to the first statement, the electoral bonds shall be encashed by an eligible political party only through a bank account with the authorized bank. See, the statement is correct. Electoral bonds which is donated to a political party can be encashed by it only through an authorized bank account in an authorized bank which is declared by the Election Commission of India. So statement one is correct. Now coming to the second statement. An artificial juridical person is not eligible to make donations to political parties via electoral bonds. See, this statement is incorrect. Any citizen of India or a body incorporated in India will be eligible to purchase the bond. This includes artificial juridical person. See, artificial juridical person means a public cooperation established under the Special Act of Legislature. See, it is a body having juristic personality of its own and is known to be artificial juridical persons. Universities are an important example of this category. So, statement 2 is incorrect. Statement 1 is correct, so the correct answer for this question is option A, 1 only. The quiz question for you all is displayed here. Interested aspirants can post the right answer in the comment section. Before moving on to the mains practice question, I have an assignment for you all. Comment in the comment section what is meant by China plus 1. 
The mains practice question is displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. If you have find this video useful, please like, do comment and share it with your friends. Thank you for listening.